Like the old saying goes, you can take a boy out of Kalihi, but you cannot take the Kalihi out of the boy. It's hard to forget the past, you know, where you grew up. It's always going to be a part of you, even though you're not living there anymore. He was a resourceful kid on the streets of Kalihi and Chinatown during World War II, and his journey has taken him from poverty to the pinnacle of philanthropy in Hawaii and beyond. The life of Lawrence Seiyu of Honolulu is next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. In this edition of Long Story Short, Dr. Lawrence K.W. Seu is accustomed to being asked for money. And he has a soft spot for those in need because he knows what it's like. He grew up poor during the Depression, started working when he was just nine years old, and eventually rose to become a local titan of philanthropy. Lawrence Seyu once lived with a loving family in what he recalls as a hut on the wrong side of the tracks. We know you as a kid from Kalihi, but you actually were not born uh, in Hawaii. No, I was born in Hong Kong. Uh, because my dad is from Hawaii, born and raised in Hawaii, and after college he went to Hong Kong to try his luck in business, and he met my mother who was from Shanghai, and I was born in Hong Kong. And when I was three years old, we came back to Hawaii. Now, your father was an educated man with a an, with an, uh, master's degree. Yes. Well, he was in the First World War, he volunteered actually at 17, forged his parents' signature to go to France to fight. And um, he, he received three Purple Hearts and participated in seven major campaign battles. So on his way back on a troop ship, he stopped by in New York and decided he, think he wants to get an education. So he worked his way through Columbia University and then got his um, master's degree from New York University, NYU. So, but then you grew up poor in Kalihi. Yes. Could he not get the job he wanted? Well, here's what happened. Uh, when he went to Hong Kong to try his business, uh, he was quite successful. Uh, met my mother in Shanghai. And my mother, of course, came from a very wealthy family in Shanghai. Uh, the, the father was a major owner of a large department store called Dyson, who was in competition with Wing On Company in, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. So they were quite wealthy. And when my grandfather passed away, uh, my uncle took over the business, kind of, and he wasn't a very good business person, so, so we kind of lost some money. So my dad said, well, maybe let's go back home and try our luck back in Honolulu, you know, so. And how did it go in Honolulu? Well, when he came back, he started a rattan furniture business, and all of his supplies came from the Philippines. So when the war started, of course, he lost his supplies and his uh, material to make furniture. So, so at that point, you know, we were quite destitute. No income, you know, no, no business, and so we just went bankrupt. And so what did he do? How did he fight the Depression? Well, he was an engineer, you know, and so he went to work for the Navy. And then we kind of built ourselves up again from, from working for the Navy at Pearl Harbor during the war. What was life like in uh, Kalihi? What street did you live on? What was your neighborhood like? The area that I grew up on was considered the poorest area of Kalihi. Uh, you have the area below the railroad track and the area above the railroad track. And, um, and the railroad track is actually Nimitz Highway right now. Now the best area of Kalihi was Kalihi Valley. That was considered the Wailai Kahala of Kalihi. <laughs> and what was it like uh, living there? Well, we had a small house, just uh, cold, cold running water and uh, no garages, you know. It was a very simple, small little hut, actually. Did you play on the street? Yes. Yeah. You didn't go to parks or anything? Oh, no, there, there wasn't very many parks then, you know. The only place that really had grass was the Bishop Museum. And uh, so my brothers and I would go to the Bishop Museum every so often so we can run on the grass to get that good feeling, you know, how it feels to run on the... And how did you get around? How did you get up to Bishop Museum? Oh, we, we walked. There was no such thing as 
a bike or, or you know, or, or riding something. We just walked. Everything was walking. Now, you uh, started working at a very young age, and it wasn't because you were hired. It was because you made your own job. What was that all about? Well, right after the Pearl Harbor, my mother said, you know what? Now's a good time to make money. I said, well, how? I said, well, you go shine shoes. I said, but I never shine shoes before. I don't know how it's done. So, um, so I asked my neighbor, you know, to help me make a shoe box from the orange crate. So, so my brother and I, my older brother, he's just about 13 months older than I am. And how old were you? I was nine and a half. And he was 10 and a half, you know. So, so we managed to somehow uh, make a shoe box and we went to town to buy a polish to shine shoes, and we never shine shoes before. We don't have no idea how it's done. <laughs> and how did you set the price? Well, it was 10 cents a shine. Okay, so. that, that you knew, okay. Yeah, that, that I knew. Well, where did you go to get your customers? We go to town, and at that time, there were a lot of sailors. Uh -huh. See, sailors are the only ones that shine their shoes. The, the soldiers had these boots, so you can't shine the boots, you know. So sailors were mostly 99% of our customers. What was your corner? Did you have a special well, place? Yes, the, the Kalihi Bunch was, was right across the street from Hawaii Theater on, on Bethel Street. And uh, we used to call it Battle Street because we had to defend our area, you know. Was there competition among the Kalihi boys? No, no. We all, all, we all help each other, yeah. Do you think that says something about the Kalihi neighborhood? Well, maybe because of the the poverty and the closeness that we kind of stuck together. So we're the only one in town that had what you call a gang to, to protect our area. So the other shoe shine boys were just stragglers. They'd come and go in you know, different areas, but we had our set street, and it was very, very lucrative. Were there other ways to make money besides sh uh, shining shoes? I, I don't know whether I should, um, well. Oh, it sounds like you should. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was another way that I used to make my money besides shining shoes and selling papers. Um, you know, these young sailors, you know, they, they come into town and they want a good time. Prostitution was legalized, and um, so they would show me, you know, bad pictures and say, "Hey, sonny boy, uh, where can I get some of this?" I said, "Oh, I said, oh, I don't know where it's," and he said, "Well, take me to the place." I said, oh, "I'm not going to take you unless you pay me first. They say, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you each give me a quarter, and I'll take you folks, you know, and show you it." More than shoe shines. Yeah, it's oh yeah, I clean up, you know. <laughs> some, some days I really did well. And once, you were how old now? Are you no, ten, ten years old? I was ten. So once we arrived, you know, at the place, I said, "Okay," I said we call them mates, you know. I said, "Okay, mate." Here's the situation. This corner is Caucasian. I always call them Howleys. This corner is Howley girls. It's ten dollars. Across the street is local girls, but young and pretty. It's five dollars. And I said, on this corner is older local girls. This is two dollars. Wow. Um, I used to be the grocery boy for the one of the madams, and every Saturday uh, I would meet her at I think about ten o'clock in the morning and I would go Chinatown shopping with her, and I would carry her bags, you know, and then we would go back to the, to the house of prostitution. Did your mother know you were doing this? No, I wouldn't you dare tell her. <laughs> and how long did you do that? You, starting at nine and a half? Yeah, until the war ended. Uh, and how much of a help was it to your family? Or, well, what did you do with the money? Did it all go to your family? What I usually do is at the end of the day, I would cash in the coins for dollar bills. And on a good day, on a Saturday, we make as much as $10 on a good day. So I would cash it all in to, for, for dollar bills, and we'd bring it home to my mother. We'd give it to her. The whole thing? Everything. And you didn't even go get a, a soda? No. In fact, um, we never ate lunch, you know, when we were shining shoes. We saved, you know, as much money as we can. So, so one day, my, my mother said, oh, um, what did you folks have for lunch? I said, we don't eat lunch. And she said, why not? And we want to save the money, you know. So she gave us a good scolding. and said, from now on, you have to go to eat and you have to eat lunch. So right on um, Hawaii and Battle Street was a fountain. 
you know, the old-fashioned fountain where you come up on a stool and you, you know, sit and you right. serve on a counter. Yeah, right. Ice yeah. cream floats and yeah, everything. Yeah, right, right. So what we did was between my brother and I, uh, I would eat first when I was younger. So we ordered a tuna sandwich and two Cokes. And you'd have half sandwich each? Yes. Yeah. Oh. We split the sandwich. <laughs> because you were saving money yeah. still. So, so I would have my own Coke and my brother would have half this, I eat half of the sandwich and then when, when I'm done, he, he would hop on a stool and he has his half of the sandwich. <laughs> so that $10, um, how much did that help your family in the money of that time? Well, in, in the early 40s, $10 goes a long way. I understand you started um, going to private school and paying your own tuition? Yes. Could that be true well, as, a, as a fifth grader? You know, the tuition then at St. Louis was only $150 a year. And when you shine shoes, they make maybe three, four dollars on a weekday, and then maybe seven, eight bucks on a Saturday. Well, you were doing it weekdays, oh, too. Oh, yeah, after school. So that's why John Henry Felix always said, oh, we make more than our parents. So, was that true, literally? Well, almost, yeah. We did make some good money, you know. Now, he was the, a Papakolea boy yeah, that yeah. you kind of took under your wing, your gang yeah. uh, joined up with. Yeah. So. And he's your close friend to this day, and he has a PhD, he's been a city councilman, he's a oh, business magnate. Yes, he, he, he's, he is what I call a success story. Right about this time, um, I know that's, uh, you decided you wanted to be a dentist at this early age. Yes, from, from the age of 12, I told myself I want to be a dentist. Why? While I was in Puhali school, uh, all the, the poorest of the poor were entitled to go to Palama Settlement for the dental work. To be poor, you don't qualify. You gotta really be destitute, practically almost. So I would get my dental checkup by going to Palama Settlement, say. And, and one time I had a very, very passionate, gentle dentist that, um, that was so painless and caring and careful that impressed me so much that I said, you know, someday I want to be a dentist and be like him. And from that time on, you were used to pretty much taking care of yourself. Yes. After the war, I got a job as a service station attendant or a mechanic helper, but I'm always working, you know, since I was nine and a half. So after you graduated from St. Louis, uh, you had a goal to go to college. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go to college, but I didn't have money, so I joined the service. And um, so I joined the Air Force because I didn't want to dig foxhole, you know. <laughs> we come from a very patriotic family. My dad, like I said, at 17, signed up for World War I. So when we became of age, you know, like he said, you know, freedom is not cheap. It's the price for freedom. And I want all of you boys to go in the service. And I want to see you guys get drafted. So my oldest brother went in the Navy. My other brother went into the Army Airborne Paratrooper. And then my younger brother went into the Marines, and I went into the Air Force. So you're in the um, you're in the service, and you're earning a GI Bill, right? Yes. Yeah, so the GI Bill I got was seventy five dollars a month, and if you were married, you had an additional seventy five dollars. So one hundred fifty dollars, I started college. You got accepted to dental school after college. Yes. Yeah, so of course, in college, you know, I had to work my way, you know, through college because the GI Bill didn't cover it all of it, and, um, and then she worked as well, yeah. And did you have kids while you were still in yes, college? Yes, uh -huh. so when I started dental school, I, um, I had two children already, so. And, and dental school, I always think of that as, um, you know, it's a professional school and people don't work while they go, but you worked full time in oh, dental school. I had to work, there was no choice, you know. So what I used to do was, school get through at five and I would go to school at reached my workplace at 6, so 6 to 12 every night. And then I get home by 1 o'clock, and then I would eat my dinner and study and, and until 6.30, and then I get up to go to school. And was uh, the dental training what you hoped it would be? Did you love it? Because this is something you had decided so oh, long before. I, I, I enjoyed every minute of dental school. I really enjoyed the challenge and the, what that I what I'd learned every day was new, that I, um, that I graduated uh, tops in my class. 
in spite of And you of went to a very good school as well. Yeah, Northwestern at that time when I applied was the number one dental school in the country. It was known as the uh, John Hopkins of dental school. Most pre-med students would apply to John Hopkins and and most or well, all, you know, pre-dental students want to apply at Northwestern. So you not only got in, but you were top of class. Yes. My children would ask me, hey, Dad, what, what makes you so motivated? And I would say, you know, I'm tired of being hungry and poor and people looking down on me, and I want to make something out of myself to, to escape the, the, the stigma of Kalihi. Now, um, your kids didn't have that stigma, and presumably they didn't grow up in Kalihi. No. So do you consider them blessed, or do you think maybe, maybe everybody needs to grow up <laughs> in Kalihi well, they, and understand the hardship? Well, that's a very good question because I, I let them know that, you know, that I grew up in Kalihi and that it, um, it takes a lot of discipline and appreciation to get out of Kalihi. And that what they have now, they should appreciate because they don't have to go through the hardship to learn what I've learned. But do they have the same motivation you did? Well, th for some reason they must have because they all did quite well in in their profession. So. Have you actually retired? Because it seems like you're at your office a lot, you're still involved, and you, if you retired, you, you must have done it fairly recently. Yes, well, after my wife passed away, she before she passed away, she made me promise her that after she's gone that I would quit my practice because she, you know, she feels that even while she was alive, I put so much hours into my practice that Without her, probably I might work myself to death, you know. So she said, okay, honey, you gotta promise me when I'm gone, you have to quit your practice and enjoy life. So a year ago, April April the 1st, 2010, I officially completely cut myself off from my practice. And do you miss it? I, I miss my patient. The dental work itself, you know, is, um, is, is a source of income, but I miss the interaction with my patients. And they were like family. Every six months on their checkup, it's a nice family reunion, you know. I remember the kids and the accomplishment, and, and it's kind of a very, very pleasant reunion. And I miss my patients. I, I love them all, they, they're really precious to me. While Lawrence Seyu was busy running his dental practice in Honolulu, a mutual friend introduced him to the woman who would become his second wife. Bo Hing Chan was raised in China, educated in Europe, and lived in Hong Kong. She came to Hawaii to vacation and to seek business contacts for a jewelry enterprise. She's the daughter of a famous general and the former governor of Canton. And um, she came on vacation, you know, to Hawaii, and we met through a friend. You know, I never believed in love at first sight, mm -hmm. but but after I met my wife, uh, it can happen. Did she feel that way too? Yes, exactly. She had inherited wealth, and you were self-made. You know, most uh, most Chinese don't give the money to the daughters; they give it to the sons. The uh, well-to-do Chinese family would send their children to Europe at that time to be educated. And that's where my, my wife went to, to Oxford and um, University of Paris. But the girls are not deprived of any, you know, conveniences or comfort, but they don't inherit money. If they do, it's a very small amount. But your wife built a fortune? On her own. She was quite an entrepreneur. So you had a very close relationship, and she really influenced your thinking about a lot of things. She's very philanthropic in many ways. So she said, with the money that we have, we should share our blessings. So do continue you know, to, to help the underprivileged and help the poor. You can't take the money with you anyway, and you can't spend it all. So. So do some good with it and, and help the underprivileged. Is that something you had been involved in before? Well, I think I, um, I got part of it from my grandfather. Most people don't realize it, but my grandfather, when he came from China uh, to help the Damon family, you know, promote the religion to the Chinese, um, he established the, um, follow the Chinese home with the Damon family to help the um, 
the uh, single Chinese men that have no place to go when they got old. So I think I must have inherited, you know, some of that um, tendencies to help. I have to say that it's such a blessing to have the money to share with others. How, how do you decide who to give to? Well, my criteria is mostly to help the underprivileged children, but it all started because I was poor myself, and my dad always mentioned, and my parents, of course, mentioned that education is one way to get out of poverty. So I thought if I can help educate the underprivileged, that would get them out of poverty. You know, some people inherit wealth, you know, and they can uh, do well with the money, but but if you have an education, to me, that's one way to meet up with the wealthy, to be on an equal level you know, playing field, so to speak. What other um, projects have caught your attention? The health care is also something is important. I'm involved with the American Cancer Society because my sister and my wife passed away from cancer. So I have a special feeling to, to help the um, the American Cancer Society. What's the gift you've given? And you've given millions of dollars to charities. What's the one that's given you the most personal pleasure or pride? The University of Oxford is, I think, one of my um, my greatest accomplishment as far as getting involved with uh, with that institution. It went through, of course, John Henry Felix, and of course, my wife got her degree from my master's degree from the University of Oxford. So that's how there's a tie to Oxford. Don't you have buildings named after you at the University of Oxford? The newest building at Harris Manchester College was named after my wife and I because of our contribution to that college. And you also have um, contributed to the uh, construction of a medical institute? Yes, um, I established the Sale Medical Institute at University of Oxford to do research in diabetes, um, um, AIDS, and um, cancer. With the major exception of Oxford University, Dr. Lawrence Sayu tries to put his money to work here in Hawaii. Among the many organizations he supports are the nursing schools at Chaminade University and the University of Hawaii, the Boy Scouts, his alma mater, St. Louis School, and he also sits on a number of nonprofit boards. Does life look really different to you in retirement? I mean, do you care about really different things? Not really, because while in practice, I was also involved in a lot of nonprofit organization. And when I retired, I just spent more time with the nonprofit organization. So there's not any difference, really. In fact, I spend more time now because I have more time to devote to them. You were married for most of your life, most of your adult life. Yes. What's it like being single now? Well, let's put it this way. I enjoy my independence. I can come and go as I please. I don't have to account to anybody what I do. And that's, that's very comforting. So it's a, good, it's a good place to be. Yes, yes. I had a good marriage, and I enjoyed it. And I don't think anybody can replace my wife. So it's no use, you know, looking. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy with my present situation. Independent, flexible, and go as I please, and come as I please. You've talked about the adversity of being poor. What is, has there been another adversity that you think has shaped you? Because you, know, you learn more from failure than from success, and from hard times than from successful times and happy times. What affected me most was the death of my family and my loved ones, you know, my sister, my parents, and my wife. That, that kind of, you know, made me look at life with a different view, that life here is only temporary, so it's better to, you know, to help others than give, than to receive. So that has been sort of my um, philosophy in life. The seed of that philosophy had been planted early on, inspired by a poem that resonated with Dr. Lawrence Seu, even as a young man with few resources and an abundance of ambition. My sister gave me a book, a poem book by Khalif Gibran, who is a very famous uh, poet. And, and I read through the book, and this one poem caught my eye that I felt was uh, was something that I would like to do and follow has a, uh, a way of life in the future. So 
Well, I can read it, you know, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah? The poem goes like this. I expect to pass through life but once. If therefore there may be any kindness I can show or any good thing I can do to any fellow being, let me do it now and not defer nor neglect it as I shall not pass this way again. So, so I feel that if I'm going to do something nice, I better do it now because I may not be able to have the opportunity to do it again. You've had a long life, but do you feel life is short? Well, when I was shining shoes, it seemed like only yesterday. That's how fast life went by. I suppose if you enjoy your life, no matter how long you've lived, it's not long enough. Yes, you still want to do more and you still want to help more. There's never enough time to, to finish your, your, your objective in life. Is there something you really need to do before you pass this way? <laughs> well, I think I've done all that I wanted and accomplished all that I wanted to accomplish. I'm a very satisfied camper. That's a lot. I don't know how many people can say that. No, I, I don't regret, and I've done everything that I wanted to do. I wanted to be a dentist. I wanted to be a pilot and fly and, and raise a family and help people and, and establish, you know, whatever I can to be a good Samaritan. So I've, done, I've accomplished everything I wanted. There's nothing I regret that I have not done. Wow. So does that mean you can... Hit the snooze button? <laughs> <laughs> I can check out anytime. <laughs> this conversation took place in 2011. In his 80s, Dr. Lawrence Sayu is not slowing down, let alone snoozing. He continues to rise hours before dawn each day to keep up his commitments, not only writing checks, but connecting people and doing everything he can to support the educational and charitable causes close to his heart. And the kid from Kalihi has made many trips to support work at the buildings at Oxford University in England, which bear the names of Dr. Lawrence and Bohing Seu. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Mahalo for being with us. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. My dad gave me a lot of advice, and so did my mom. What I remembered very clearly was when he told me one time, he said, you know, son, the average person learns from experience, but a wise man learns from experience of others. So, so when I hear things and I listen and I, I would learn from what I hear and I try to avoid that mistake.